The light from the remote operated vehicle speared the sunless depths of the deep ocean. I sat nearly a mile away, operating the vehicle from the underwater base I'd been living on with five other people for nearly two months. The screen on my computer showed the camera feed, allowing me to see what the vehicle was seeing. I held a rectangular remote in my hands. My thumbs and index fingers controlled the vehicle as it skimmed over a deep sea coral reef. I was scanning for a specific type of coral polyp that we could harvest. The scientific name for the type of coral we were after was a mouthful, so we just called it Miracle Coral. It had many different properties, mostly medicinal, that made it very valuable. Miracle Coral was a species that only lived in the deep sea and only at depths that were dangerous to humans. This was why we used the remote operated harvesting vehicle. Wait, Leonard, my harvesting partner said. Slow down and rotate clockwise 45 degrees. Leonard sat at a station next to mine, watching the camera feed on a different computer. His job was to look out for Miracle Coral while I concentrated on controlling the vehicle. But we often made it a game to see who could spot some of the spiky coral first. I stopped the vehicle and turned it 45 degrees, but didn't see anything other than an irregular forest of other deep sea coral species. Little bits of marine snow fell through the powerful beam of light, a mixture of dead organisms, feces, and silt. Rotate clockwise a little more, Leonard said. I did, flinching in my seat as a large and gruesome looking creature came into view floating just a few feet from the vehicle. Good Lord, <laughs> Leonard said, laughing. Scared the hell out of me. The thing faintly resembled a shark, but it wasn't like one I'd ever seen before. What the hell is that thing? I asked. I think it's a goblin shark, Leonard said, voice uncertain. But maybe not. It has like tentacles coming out of its back or something. The creature had a blade-shaped snout that extended out far over its mouth, which was lined with a mess of needle-like teeth. It almost looked like a shark mixed with an alligator. Its head was turned slightly, allowing one of its black eyes to gaze at the camera with predatory interest. Since it was head-on toward the camera, I could just barely see what appeared to be a half dozen thin, transparent tentacles waving in the unseen currents near its tail. Goblin sharks have tentacles? I asked. No, Leonard said. Maybe some other creature has latched onto it or something. I don't know, but look underneath it. I turned my gaze to the area directly underneath the sea creature and saw a patch of miracle coral. It's almost like he's protecting it or something, Leonard said. After a moment, the creature thrashed in the water, prompting me to back the vehicle off of it. What's it doing? I asked. I don't know. Leonard said as it continued to thrash. A cloud of gray liquid suddenly emerged from the creature's belly near its tail. The milky liquid floated down toward the coral. The creature thrashed a few more times and then swam away quickly, allowing me only a brief glimpse of the tentacles. They looked to be part of its body. Did it just piss on our coral? Leonard asked. I looked over at him. Either he pissed on it or... What does goblin shark look like? We both had a good laugh at that and then got to work harvesting the coral with the arms on the vehicle. We weren't about to let whatever the creature had done stop us from collecting. If we beat our quota, we'd get a sizable bonus once we arrived back on dry land. After an hour of delicate work that would allow the miracle coral to grow back eventually, we marked the coordinates on our map and then I steered the vehicle back to the base. Once the vehicle was in the loading dock with the door closed, I radioed the lab to hand things off to the scientist on shift. Hey Becky, got a load for you, I said. I saw that, she said. I'll get it in a minute. Thank you, John. Sure thing, just uh, be careful. We think a goblin shark peed on it. I couldn't help myself. Before I even finished the sentence, I burst into laughter. <laughs> Becky chuckled over the radio. Is that so? I wonder if goblin shark pee has any medicinal value. I'll leave that for you to determine. Gee, thanks, she said before signing off. I pushed back from my desk. How about some food? I asked Leonard. He looked at his watch. It is about lunchtime. 
We headed off to the tiny cafeteria to get some grub, not knowing that it would be our last meal before everything went to hell. After lunch, I had a few minutes to spare, so I looked up goblin sharks on my company tablet. Sure enough, the creature we'd seen closely resembled a goblin shark, but there was no mention of those sharks ever having tentacles growing out of them. I wondered if we'd seen a new species. It wouldn't have been a big surprise. The deep sea was home to many creatures humankind knew next to nothing about. We'd only just discovered the benefits of miracle coral, and some estimates put the number of deep sea species at more than 10 million. Luckily, we recorded all our harvesting trips. We could flag the footage with the creature in it and send it to some scientists who would figure out whether it was an undiscovered species or not. All that was way above my pay grade. Leonard and I finished the day without any more luck. No more miracle coral. That was how most days went after all. The stuff was rare. I guess all the good stuff was. After we shut down for the day and were headed past the lab, we decided to stop and see if Becky wanted to join us for a VR game in the lounge. We came to the lab door, which had a thick pane of glass in it, and looked through to see Becky standing with her back to us. Her head was tilted down to look at something on her workbench. I raised a fist and banged on the door. Us lowly harvesters didn't have access to the lab. Still, Becky made no move. Must be engrossed in something, Leonard said. Yeah. I replied, shrugging off a bad feeling that suddenly came to me. We headed off down the hall to the lounge, finding that Sarah, one of the technicians, was already there, getting ready to blow off some steam in virtual reality. Our favorite was mini golf because it was so relaxing and made us feel as if we weren't cooped up in a tiny station nearly a thousand feet under the ocean's surface. So we all put on headsets and got a game going. We were on the seventh hole when the screaming started. What the hell is that? Leonard said as we all took our headsets off and looked toward the lounge door. Is that Lonnie? Sarah asked, green eyes fixed on the doorway. I set my headset down on the couch and moved slowly toward the door. It did sound like Lonnie, and it sounded like it was coming from the lab. The station was essentially a large circle so I couldn't see the lab thanks to the curved hallway as I peeked my head out of the lounge and looked to the right. What was that? A voice to my left said, startling me. I turned to see Ravi, the station director, coming down the hall. I don't know. Let's go see, Ravi said. The four of us moved down the hall toward the lab, Ravi and me in the lead, Leonard and Sarah following behind. As we brought the lab into view, we saw Lonnie on the floor still wearing his lab coat. Oh my God, Ravi said. Lonnie's face was a mess of blood and bone, like his head had been shoved into a huge blender. What the f Sarah screamed. The station lights went out with an electronic thud, plunging us into darkness for a moment before the emergency lights kicked on. In the dim illumination, I looked through the lab door for Becky. There was no sign of her. Becky did this? Ravi asked. No way. I said, not possible. There's no other explanation. You were all together, and it certainly wasn't me, Ravi said. And why else would she shut off the lights? I'm gonna go find her, I said, starting down the hall. I'd made it about six feet when Ravi stopped me by shouting, Wait! I glanced over my shoulder, seeing that all three of them were looking down at Lonnie's body. It was shaking like he was being electrocuted. We all stared, dumbfounded. Before I could ask if he was still alive, Lonnie's head exploded, splashing white-red goo all over Ravi, Leonard, and Sarah. I was standing far enough away that I only got some on my shoe, but they had it all over them, on their faces, clothes, and hands. The memory of the thrashing goblin shark suddenly came to mind as my three co-workers gasped and cursed and wiped the stuff off their faces. Lonnie's body had stopped moving and now lay still again. Only now there was a gaping hole where his torn up face had once been. I turned and ran down the hall, determined to find Becky. But I was also worried about whatever had come out of Lonnie's head. I checked the control center first, but saw no sign of Becky. However, I saw that the control panel for the station lights had been smashed with a hatchet, which was still sticking out of the panel. I yanked the hatchet out and took it with me as I moved around the circular station. 
As I approached the door to the emergency escape pods, I knew I would find Becky in there before I ever saw her. Her back was to me as I looked through the glass of the closed door. She was trying to get the door to one of the pods open, but was having trouble. She kept entering the wrong code. I pressed a button and the door slid open. Becky spun around. A scream tore from my throat at the sight of her face. Her eyes had grown wider and angled out so they were nearly on her temples. They had changed from ocean blue to coal black. Her nose had elongated by several inches and her jaw looked to have been broken by a second mouth sticking out, this one with rows of needle-sharp teeth. As she rushed toward me, I saw why she'd been having trouble entering the code. Her fingers were overly long and wavy, like the tentacles sticking out of the goblin shark we'd seen. I jumped out of the way as she came through the door, but her tentacle-like fingers wrapped around my left wrist. Shouting, I brought the hatchet up and slammed it into her deformed face. She let out an ear-splitting screech, her tentacles snapping my left forearm. I cried out in pain and yanked the blade out of her head, slamming it back in a moment later. She went down, but she still had hold of my broken arm, so I went down too. <laughs> Luckily, I ended up on top of her. After a few more chops with the hatchet, she stopped moving and the tentacles loosened. I scrambled away and sat against the wall, looking down at my broken arm as I gasped in pain. <laughs> Becky's body suddenly started shaking. I lurched to my feet and got away just before her head exploded, sending the blood-tinted goo everywhere. I stumbled down the hall, looking over my shoulder, wondering what to do next. When I faced forward, I saw Ravi, Leonard, and Sarah standing shoulder to shoulder in the hallway, staring at me. I raised the hatchet, but Leonard jumped forward and caught my arm, ripping the tool away with ease. Ravi stepped in and hit me with a right hook. I went down, the world going as dark and silent as the deep sea. I had no idea how much time had passed when I came to. I was on the floor of the escape pod room. Ravi and Leonard held me down. Sarah stood over me, looking down. Her eyes were dark, and her face was already beginning to deform. Same with Ravi and Leonard. With overlong fingers, Sarah lifted her shirt up, revealing her stomach. But there was something there that didn't belong. Almost like a second belly button, only larger and more pronounced. As she started shaking, I thrashed, trying to get free. Ravi and Leonard held me down with ease. After a long moment, that second belly button in Sarah's stomach spewed milky goo all over me. When it was done, she stopped shaking, lowered her shirt, and resumed staring at me. Ravi opened his mouth wide, as though he'd gotten stuck in mid-yawn. I could see the second pair of jaws forming in his mouth, slowly inching forward. But suddenly it didn't seem so strange to me. Suddenly, it was as if humans were supposed to be part of Goblin Shark, part tentacled creature, and part something else. Some kind of organism that hijacked animals and used them for its own survival. Ravi and Leonard let me go, and I got to my feet. Using my still unchanged fingers, I entered the codes on the escape pods and allowed Ravi, Leonard, and Sarah to climb inside. With a couple of taps of my finger, I programmed the pods to ascend and release an emergency beacon. Then I climbed into the fourth pod and did the same. I heard the whoosh of the other pods launching, one at a time. Then mine launched, and I was hurtling toward the surface of the ocean. As I went, I thought about the organism that seemed like it had always been with me. I knew that this organism had come from the deepest depths of the ocean and had been working its way up the layers for thousands of years. It was as if I had always known this. The problem was that survival was hard down at the bottom of the ocean. Food was in short supply, and it had been trying to make its way up to where food was more plentiful. But the animals that hijacked it couldn't survive in the upper layers. They had evolved to remain in the deep ocean. But only a few short years ago, the organism had come across animals who seemed to be able to travel to and from the deep ocean at will. They came to the depths in strange, bright vehicles and were soon gone again. It hadn't been able to find a way to access these seemingly intelligent animals until now. I peer up through the vision dome on my exosuit. The boat I was just on minutes ago sits a good hundred feet overhead, floating on the ocean's surface. It grows smaller and smaller as I watch, 
descending toward the pitch black depths in my newt suit. A glance to my left through the vision dome shows me the second newt suit, descending at the same rate as mine. I can't see Milford Westing's face, but I can picture it in my mind. It's a punchable face if there ever was one. He looks like a rat mixed with a weasel, but he's the billionaire, not me. And he's paying a pretty penny for this whole excursion. Still, the fact that he's a billionaire doesn't make me want to punch him in the face any less because he's also an asshole. Maybe there's a billionaire out there that's not an asshole, or maybe it comes with the territory. Either way, I want to get through this rich man's adventure fully intact, if I can help it. Looking down reveals nothing but darkness, as though I'm headed not into the ocean, but into a black hole that has no end. I'll just keep falling and falling until my rebreather stops functioning or the newt suit loses power. Of all the ways to die in the deep sea, suffocation would be among the worst. I'd rather go quickly. Catastrophic failure of my newt suit would accomplish that easily. The pressure at the depths we're headed to is more than enough to end a human life so quickly that the brain wouldn't have time to register the pain of implosion. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, the newt suit is too well built to experience catastrophic implosion under normal conditions, which means a slow, agonizing death is the more likely option. And I know that each time I venture into the depths, I'm daring God or the universe or Mr. Reaper to tap me on the shoulder and tell me my time is up. The newt suits are essentially one-man pressure vessels with fully articulating arms and legs, the joints designed to withstand the crushing pressures of the deep ocean. They kind of look like Iron Man suits, although much larger and not as sleek. Their bright yellow coloring makes them easy to see in case of a rescue mission, at least in theory. Where we're going, we won't be able to see anything without the high-powered lights attached to our suits. There are cameras attached as well, sending the feed up to the boat. We also have radio contact so we can talk to each other and the boat. But I'm more uneasy about this dive than any other I've done in my career. Every other dive has been with a professional, not some rich jerkwad who trained for two weeks and thinks he's now an expert in deep sea submersible operation. Even after we made it abundantly clear to him that he would have a diving partner, he still said, I don't need a babysitter, as we were suiting up. I swear, if he gets me killed, I'll come back to haunt him. Then he'll probably hire the best exorcist money can buy to get rid of me. How long does this take again? Milford asks over the radio. The 800 pound suits would descend too fast if we just let them drop. So the thrusters are on low, keeping our descent within acceptable bounds. The team up on the boat is monitoring the suits to make sure everything is looking good. If they see something wrong, they'll remotely pull us back up, taking over the controls. It's all for safety, but apparently it's not fast enough for his highness. I explain this to Milford, telling him it's for his own good. I wish we could do this faster, he says. I'm a busy man. I roll my eyes and clench my teeth, biting back the retort I so want to say. Everyone knows Milford inherited his business empire from his father. It pretty much operates on its own, like his own personal money machine. Busy my ass. As the minutes pass, we go farther down into the darkness. Pretty soon, I can no longer see the boat overhead. Sensing the darkness, the powerful lights on either side of our vision domes turn on, revealing nothing but falling marine snow and the occasional fish zooming away from us. Wow, Milford says. How deep are we? It's questions like these that make me wonder whether he trained at all. Check your gauges on your left arm. Oh, right, he says. I check mine, seeing that we're coming up on the midnight zone. I look up through the vision dome and find that the area above is nothing but a slightly lighter shade of black. We're deep, almost as deep as any human has ever gone wearing a deep sea exosuit. People have gotten much deeper in deep sea submersibles, but not exosuits. We've sent suits down to the depths before, but never with people in them. This is a first, but the excitement of breaking a record is overshadowed by Milford. After all, I will only be a footnote in history if I'm mentioned at all. The headlines will all be about how the brilliant billionaire went deeper into the ocean than anyone before him. Then again, 
that's only if we live. If we die, the headlines will be about how anyone could let such a thing happen to such a bright billionaire. Never mind the fact that Milford had to grease a bunch of palms to even get approval for such a dive. Of course, I'll be dead, so I guess it won't matter much to me. God forbid I live and Milford dies, I'd probably get sued into oblivion. Okay, you're 50 meters from the ocean floor, Juresh says over the radio. Her voice comes through clear and it provides a sense of calm that I desperately need. We're slowing your descent. Juresh is the dive coordinator. She's the one who found the spot and now she's the one overseeing the entire thing. She's a consummate professional who is very good at what she does. She even said there would be a whale fall down here, the reason for picking this spot. Whale falls, which are dead whale carcasses, are hot spots of deep sea activity. The idea is that we'll give Milford something to watch on the dive, to make sure he feels he's got his money's worth. I feel the newt suit slow as I peer down, seeing the edges of craggy underwater hills forming out of the darkness. Moments later, our suits land gently on a relatively flat portion of the ocean floor, kicking up small clouds of silt. Okay, seating control back to you, Juresh says. Good luck and stay safe. We'll be watching closely. Thanks, Juresh, I say, testing the foot controls to make sure they're working properly. They are, allowing me to take a couple of steps on the ocean floor. I turn to look at Milford, seeing that he's struggling with the controls. It's fine with me if he spends all his time trying to figure out how to move around. We only have an hour down here, and if he can't move, he can't get into trouble. It's his own fault for not training properly. I take a moment to look around, seeing a few strange creatures hanging around outside the pool of light from our suits. I'm sure most, if not all of them, have never seen anything like us before. To my dismay, Milford gets his suit working. After looking around, he turns toward me. Where's this dead whale we're here to see? Follow me, I say, turning to walk where Juresh told me the whale fall was. We haven't even been moving for two minutes when Milford starts to complain. How far is it? I don't want to spend the whole hour down here walking around in the dark, not seeing anything. Be patient. It should be just up ahead. We walk for a few minutes before coming to a wide but shallow dip in the ocean floor. Whoa, Milford says. Look at that. In the dip, some 10 or 15 feet below us, is the promised whale carcass. Mostly, it's just bones but there's still a decent amount of meat left on it in one area. Various small creatures scuttle over the meat, feeding on the dead whale. There are strange divots on the ocean floor underneath the remaining whale meat. I've seen some whales fall before, but those divots are new. They look to be about the diameter of a basketball, and there are six or seven of them. Let's get closer, Milford says. You might scare away the sea life, I say but he's already moving, using his thrusters to sail down the slope, getting to within a few yards of the whale fall. Looking at those strange divots, I decide to listen to my gut and stay where I am. Don't get too close, I say. Milford ignores me, stepping closer. Pretty soon, the small creatures scatter. Aw, man. A large shadow emerges from the darkness on the other side of the whale carcass, prompting Milford to pull in a sharp breath. Tentacles emerge, spreading toward the billionaire, only angling down at the last moment to latch onto the whale. The octopus settles down on the remaining meat and starts to dig in. Holy sh! that was freaky, Milford says. I can't help but chuckle. (laughs) The laughter dies in my throat as dozens of cockroach-like creatures shoot out of the divots in the ocean floor and attack the octopus. They look like giant isopods, pale pink in color with 14 legs, segmented shells, and two antennae. But I've never heard of giant isopods attacking an octopus. Each one is about the size of a small dog. The isopods assault the octopus with thrashing segmented legs. They use the sharp legs to latch on before attacking it with the four sets of jaws each isopod has. Using its tentacles and a squirt of ink, 
The octopus manages to get away, but not without losing one of its tentacles in the process. The isopods soon begin to fight each other over the appendage, devouring it quickly. Uh, I think it's time to go, I say to Milford. I've never seen isopods act like that. Two of the gruesome looking creatures turn toward us, as though they heard me speak. Before I can say anything else, the isopods are scrabbling toward Milford, their pointed legs stirring up silt on the ocean floor as they rush like scattering cockroaches. Milford screams as they climb up his suit. Through the special underwater radio, I can hear the sounds that their legs make on the tough metal. Use your thrusters, I say, doing just that as I speak. I rise several feet over the ridge I was standing on, looking down at Milford. I can see his face through the well-lit vision dome just a moment before it's covered over by one of the isopods. Help me, you coward! He screams. They're tearing my suit apart! Use your thrusters! I say again. Help! There's a muted boom as Milford's suit implodes below me, sending shockwaves through the water. The isopods squirm in the water, their bodies torn apart in the powerful implosion. Several of the still intact ones swim after me, but I'm already too far away. The thrusters on full blast to get me out of there. Did you see that? I ask. Juresh, tell me you saw that. Sorry, we lost communication for a few moments. What happened? We can't connect with Mr. Westing's suit. He's dead, I say. I'm coming up. He's dead? How? My camera's caught the whole thing. Jesus Christ, that was insane. I've never seen anything like that. Those isopods attacked him. They just attacked him. I'm back on the ship, and we're waiting for the Coast Guard to come out so they can investigate the incident. I'm showered and fed and looking for answers. As soon as she spotted trouble, Juresh should have taken control of Milford's suit and gotten him out of there. It may not have worked, but at least she could have tried. I found her out on the bow of the ship, talking on a phone. There's a headwind, which is probably why she doesn't hear me approaching. But the wind catches her words and brings them back to me as I come up behind her. Yes, it's done, Eliana, she says. It won't just look like an accident. It was an accident, a terrible, tragic accident. I freeze, still several feet away from her. Eliana, I know that name. That's the name of Milford Westing's wife. I stand there and wait, listening until Juresh turns and sees me. She flinches as though I hit her, then she quickly ends the phone call. We stare at each other for a long moment. She drops her eyes. How much did you hear? Enough to put it together, I say. But I'm curious. How did you know about those isopods? Juresh hesitates, dark eyes looking everywhere but at me. Are you going to turn me in? Answer the question. How did you know they would be there? I discovered them while scouting locations for the dive. I watched on the rover feed as they attacked and ate a shark. I study her for a long moment. And what would you have done if they attacked me? You're smarter than that, she says. I knew you could get away. You knew it, huh? I think it's more likely that you were paid enough to take the chance. A heavy silence stretches between us. The wind blowing past and the salt water lapping at the boat create a lonesome ambiance. Are you going to turn me in? She asks. That depends, I say. How much is my cut? They're coming! Rory says between quick, heavy breaths. Sitting in the co-pilot seat on the first of its kind submersible, I stare at Rory's leathery forehead, watching a droplet of sweat work its way down from his receding hairline. At first, I don't know who he's talking about, although it feels like I should. Then, through the strange haze that has infiltrated my mind, I remember that we're in trouble. The radiance has failed. Something went wrong, causing us to lose the use of our thrusters. The ballast tank controls aren't responding, meaning we're stuck deep in the ocean where the sun never reaches. They're coming, he says again, looking out the viewing window at the patch of gray sea floor lit by the Radiance's lights. It's Rory's baby, and he named it the Radiance because he said he was going to bring light to the depths of the ocean. What hubris. How could I have admired this man? He's going to get us killed. Maybe we're already dead and we don't even know it. 
Can you try them again? Ned asks from one of the two seats behind us. Both Rory and I flinch in our seats, turning to look back. I'd forgotten about Ned and Cole. They're both passengers on the Radiance, here to see parts of the world that only a handful of people have ever seen. Ned and Cole are business partners in a successful tech startup. They're both in their late 20s, but they're looking at Rory and I like we're the only adults in the submersible. And in a way, I guess we are. Something scratches at my subconscious, like a rat trapped in a wall. How could I forget that they were here with us? Something's wrong with my brain, but the notion is a far away one, hiding behind layers of impenetrable mental fog. I've tried them a dozen times, Rory says, clearly angry. The emergency beacon is going, they're coming. Are you sure they're coming? Cole asks in a boyish, frightened voice. Of course I'm sure, Rory snaps. I designed the emergency beacon myself. I know how it works. You also designed this fucking submersible. And now here we are, stuck on the bottom of the ocean. For a long moment, I have trouble determining who said that. But I soon realize it was me. I said it. Strange. It was like someone else was controlling my voice. Rory glares at me. I glare back, watching the beads of sweat coalesce on his forehead. It's hot. So hot. Why? An alarm blares. The two screens on the control panel flash a warning. I glance at the nearer screen, some part of me understanding what the warning says, but that understanding seems to float away a moment later. Carbon dioxide levels rising? Rory asks, as though he's trying to comprehend those words. Turn it off! Ned shouts. It's too loud! A sudden flash of clarity comes to me in the form of a list of symptoms. Too much CO2 can cause hypercapnia. Symptoms of hypercapnia include confusion, altered mental state, paranoia, seizures, and even death. Where are you going? Ned shouts again. I turn to look back in time to see Cole rushing into the rear chamber of the submersible. He shuts the heavy door between the two chambers. What is he doing? I think. My flash of clarity fading away like a rock dropped into the ocean. The alarm is still blaring. Without thinking much about it, I reach out and hit a button to turn it off. Hypercapnia, coal, carbon dioxide. These seemingly disparate thoughts float through my mind like puzzle pieces belonging to entirely different puzzles. I turn back and look at Ned, who's sweating and breathing almost as hard as Rory. I suddenly realize I'm breathing hard too. Hypercapnia, carbon dioxide. Sunlight breaks through the clouds of my mind once again. The human body's breathing functions work by detecting the amount of carbon dioxide in the body signaling the lungs to breathe to expel the waste gas. Staring at Ned, I realize why we're all breathing so heavily. There's too much carbon dioxide. Our bodies are trying to expel it, but it can't because the levels are too high in the submersible. Cole. The emergency oxygen tanks! I blurt out. They're all back there! Ned and Rory look at me like confused children. I get to my feet and rush back to the chamber door, grabbing the hand wheel in the middle and trying to turn it. It moves a couple of inches before catching on something. Cole has jammed the door from the other side somehow. What are you doing? Rory yells from behind me. I ignore him and grab the fire extinguisher from the wall nearby and bang it on the door. A hand grabs me from behind. I whip around and lash out with the fire extinguisher, hitting Rory in the face with it. He falls back against the back of Ned's seat and then hits the floor, blood coming out of a gash just over his left cheekbone. Something like clarity comes to me again. This is their plan. They're all working together to get rid of me, so there will be more oxygen for them. Cole's job is to secure the oxygen tanks, leaving Ned and Rory to get rid of me. And when the rescue team finally arrives, they can say I went crazy and they had to put me down. As if to solidify the notion, Ned lunges up from his seat and rushes toward me. I yank the safety pin from the extinguisher and then squeeze the handle, shooting the powdery substance into Ned's face. He turns back and moves between the seats toward the front of the submersible, hands to his eyes as he tries to clear the powder. With Ned now out of the way in the narrow space, Rory attempts to get to his feet. I can't let him. I step forward and slam the bottom of the extinguisher into his head, sending him back down to the floor. I shove the hose into his mouth and squeeze the handle again, pumping the powder into his lungs as his body automatically breathes quickly in an effort to get rid of carbon dioxide. He coughs and some powder comes out of his nose. 
but then he's writhing on the ground, clawing at his neck. I step away, moving toward Ned, who's looking at me through tear-filled red eyes. You thought you could kill me? I ask, huffing. You thought I would just let you kill me? Ty, please, Ned says. I don't know what you're talking about. I faint forward with the fire extinguisher, pretending like I'm going to hit him in the head. He brings his hands up to ward off the blow, but it never comes. Instead, I kick him as hard as I can between the legs. He cries out, doubling over. I raised the fire extinguisher high, the top of the thing hitting the low ceiling. I bring it down square on the back of his head. He goes down between the seats, and I hit him again, eliciting a wet crunch. After several more strikes, the bottom of the extinguisher is covered in blood. Ned and Rory are no longer moving. I'm huffing and puffing, but I still feel like I'm suffocating. I can't get enough oxygen. I turn back to the door and bang on it with my fist. Cole, please! We're all going to die if we don't get some oxygen! What was that noise? Cole asks, voice muted both by the door and the mask I know he's wearing. What happened? Rory and Ned attacked each other before passing out, I say, every other word interrupted by a gasp. We need an oxygen tank. We can just share one. You can keep the other ones if you want. We just need one to share or we'll die. I'm sorry, Cole says from the other side of the door. I wasn't thinking clearly. I realize that now. Step away from the door and I'll give you one. I move away from the door and then call out. Okay. I'm away from the door. The hand wheel in the middle turns as he opens the door from the other side. Tell me where you are again. He calls, the door still closed. I'm away from the door. Please, Cole. We're dying. The wheel spins the rest of the way. Then the door opens toward me a crack and an oxygen bottle emerges. Once it's clear of the door, it shuts again. I rush forward and grab the bottle, pulling the mask over my head. The first breaths of oxygen are sweet, but it takes nearly 10 minutes for my breathing to return to something close to normal. During that time, my head slowly clears, the horror of what I've done emerging like a nightmare in reverse. As clarity settles on me, true clarity, I look down at Ned and Rory's bodies. Rory's eyes are still open, his nose and mouth stopped up with the yellow-white powder from the extinguisher. Ned's body lies face down, his skull cracked open, blood mixing with the powder from the extinguisher on the floor. I stand near the closed door, staring down at their bodies, thinking furiously. Suddenly, there's a metallic thunk from outside, and the submersible shifts. I look up at the ceiling, even though I can't see outside. I know it's the rescue vessel coming to save us. That's the rescue vessel! I call out, putting as much joy and excitement into my voice as I can. The hand wheel on the chamber door moves quickly. Cole is opening it up. I grab the fire extinguisher once again and step close to the door. Cole tried to attack me, that's what I'll say. He tried to attack me, so I locked myself in the rear of the vessel. Then he attacked and killed Rory and Ned. Only I didn't know that, not until I opened the door to give them an oxygen tank. That was when I saw what he'd done. And then he came at me with the fire extinguisher. I had to defend myself, I didn't have a choice. It was Cole, it was all Cole. Listen, I'm sorry. Cole says as he opens the door all the way. His eyes go wide just before I slam the extinguisher into his face. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video. You can also check out some more of my animated horror stories right here.